out of cover. <laughs> Please check. Can you see my face? <laughs> yeah. Okay, good? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, hi. Uh, tonight we're going to have a teach back on the three chapters that you were supposed to read. The first one is about what? Brain and cranial nerves, followed by the autonomic nervous system and a teach back on what? Sense organs, both general and special sense organs. So it's important, therefore, that let's deal first with the brain and later on about the cranial nerves, right? The brain is protected by the skull together with the meninges. At the same time, the cerebrospinal fluid. At the same time, we know that the brain has different lobes, right? And as I told you before, it's important to know structure and most importantly, what? Function. The function, right? The brain has the frontal lobe. What's the next one? Frontal. Right the lobe, followed by? Sepital lobe. And the other one is what? So as you can clearly see, there are four. Each of these lobes have specific functions. Which among these lobes would be f where you find the visual cortex? So except for the lobe, you put the word visual cortex. Okay? Now what about the auditory cortex? Temporal. Yes, you are right. Temporal lobe. And then, of course, what about the motor cortex, the primary motor cortex? Frontal. Okay, which part of the frontal lobe? There is a specific area where you find the primary somatomotor area. Okay, it's called the pre-central what? Gyrus of what lobe? Frontal lobe. It is where you find the primary motor what? Cortex. Cortex. In other words, what it simply means is that this is the part of the brain that controls the movements we make. Especially those movements that are brought about by the contraction of what? Skeletal muscles. If you remember, skeletal muscles are technically what? Voluntary muscles. Therefore, as such, they are what? Controlled by the brain. Which part of the brain? The precentral gyrus of the human brain. Right? Okay, now, what about the primary sensory cortex? Where is it found? What part of the parietal lobe? Okay, so here it's post central gyrus of what lobe? Parietal lobe, and what is that called? Somatosensory. Somatosensory cortex. But the word somato means the body, sensory means all. The sensory inputs that you have will eventually end up with what lobe? The parietal lobe. Which part of the parietal lobe? Okay. Now, before I proceed, let me just talk about the importance of the human brain structure, right? On the surface of the brain, so just to make sure you understand what is a sulcus and a gyrus, which one is the groove or canal? Sulcus, very good. Which one is the ridge or fold? The gyrus. Okay? The word sulcus, if it's only one, it's called sulcus. If it's more than one, it's called sulci, plural. Sulcus means groove or canal. And on the other hand, your gyrus or gyri, if it's plural, means a fold or a ridge. So let me just get this piece of paper here. If I make this into a fold, and then canal and groove like this. So which one is the groove? Focus. Which one is the fold? Yeah. Of course, you see the analogy, right? Can anybody tell me what is the significance of these? What would the presence of the folds and the canal or grooves put a, an advantage to the human brain? What does it do? More space. More space. Can you be more specific than more space? Yes. In terms of mathematical and physics terms? Surface there area. you go. It will increase the surface area. So what does it tell us? 
that humans like you and I, intelligence is determined by the amount of soul sci and gyra you have. The more soul sci and gyra you have, the greater what? Intelligence. Surface area. And hopefully, there is more area to what? <laughs> to store information, right? In other words, it is not the size of the brain that matters. You could have a brain as big as this room. But if it's flat, what will it that tell you? There's no what? Surface area that is going to be increased, right? On the other hand, if your brain is small as our brain, enclosed inside the skull, because of the presence of the sulci and gyra increases the surface area, right? So what separates the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe is what sulcus? Central sulcus. Central sulcus. Can you check? It's on? Okay, good. <laughs> Sometimes it turns off by itself. <laughs> now, the idea therefore is that central sulcus is separating the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe. And whether you like it or not, we are of the same species. We're all somewhere sapiens. And therefore, we have the same structures in our brain, okay? And um, when I was a nine-year-old kid uh, in elementary school, I already knew some of these things because I was so fascinated with the human brain. I asked myself, what is the basis for memory? How come I'm able to remember things? Things that are relevant to me as a student in the learning process. I, I thought that I had such a good memory. I would get a perfect score in my quizzes and of course, my mom was a pharmacist and my dad was an engineer, but they could not satisfy my curiosity. So I went to the library. And the good thing was the school I went to was an American missionary school. So we had all schools, uh, books coming from the US. And I found out, I already knew about the gyrus and the sulcus and how it will increase the surface area. So what I learned in 1969, when I was a nine-year-old boy, and when I went to medical school and now as a professor here, I learned the same things. It is the sulcus and the gyrus that determine the surface area. The more surface area you have means the more sulci and gyro you have. Therefore, the greater capacity to what? Store that information. But it is up to you to determine which information you need to store. And I think that's the biggest challenge that you have in this class, right? There's so much things to learn. You're overwhelmed. And you say, Dr. Gamma, which one will I store? Which one should I throw in the trash can of information? And that's a, that's a thing you have to develop in your own way of learning now. So, in terms of all these, we know for a fact that these are important things, right? Now, what about your uh, diencephalon? What are the components of your diencephalon? Okay, you have the epithalamus. What's the other one? Thalamus. And what about the other one that's been below the thalamus? Hypothalamus. Now, the word epi means above the thalamus. Among the three, which one contains the pineal gland? And what does the pineal gland secrete? And what is melatonin for? What is it for? It regulates your sleeping and waking patterns, the night and day cycles. Okay? Night, day. Can somebody summarize this into one word? Circadian rhythm. Circadian rhythm. It's actually two words, but the most important word is circadian, right? Okay? So in the learning process, you will be exposed to a lot of words. And what I've been telling you all the time is that the more words you know, the more successful you become. A person with limited vocabulary will have a hard time with struggle in whatever endeavors you do. Circadian rhythm, day and night cycle, sleeping and waking patterns. In a normal routine of life, we always sleep at night, we wake up in the morning. Unless we work in the hospital, right? At night. <laughs> now, what about the thalamus? What is the most important function of this structure called the thalamus? Yes? Very good. I think you are in the right proper frame, okay? Relay station. For what kind of impulses? Sensory. In other words, if somebody will pinch me now, that will be what? An action potential or nerve impulse traveling to the sensory nerve. Remember, it goes into the dorsal root, goes to the spinal cord, then the ascending pathway. Remember the word ascending pathway, sensory pathways? They will what? Go to the medulla, 
and then cross to the opposite side. Remember, the crossing of the nerve fiber tracts will occur. Before reaching the right parietal lobe, because I was pinned here, before reaching the right parietal lobe's post central gyrus, it has to pass where? The thalamus. It's like a gatekeeper. It's like a border patrol. Hey, you're not sensory. Go to motor pathways. You understand? Now, so therefore, the thalamus is the sensory pathways, right? Relay station. Now, what about the hypothalamus? What makes the hypothalamus very important? Yes, please. Give me any information you know. Hmm? So, what does it do? It controls what? Okay. We used to call the pituitary gland as the master gland. But now we realize that the master gland actually has its own master. And who is the master of the master gland? The hypothalamus. It controls the pituitary gland. In fact, there are two hormones produced here. And what are these two hormones? What are the two hormones produced by the hypothalamus? Growth. Oxytocin and Of course. How did you know? How come you know? You know, okay, good for you, okay? The answer is correct. It produces what? Oxytocin and ADH. Oxytocin is important for uterine contraction during what? Labor. When the mother is about to go into labor and have the baby come out. What about uh, ADH? Antidiuretic hormone is a hormone produced by the hypothalamus that will promote the kidney to what? Retain the information, right? I'm sorry, blood. Uh, water. water. Well, I'm using the, wrong, the words. Retain water by the kidney, right? Retain water. Antidiuretic hormone, okay? Now, what else can the hypothalamus do aside from controlling the uh, pituitary glands? Emotions. Emotions, yes, that's one, right? Autonomic functions. Hmm? Controls autonomic functions, yes, it, it regulates them. What else? There's something very important. Temperature there regulation. you go. Temperature what? Regulation. I remember in one time, in one of the questions in the nursing board exam, they were asking the, 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 the people taking the exam, a patient was brought to the emergency room, and upon admission, the temperature pattern was going up and down. And the question was, what part of the brain is responsible for temperature regulation? The answer would be hypothalamus. hypothalamus. Okay. Now, let's talk about the, uh, the basal ganglia. What are the components of the basal ganglia? That's in your study guide, right? Yes? Caudate nucleus. What else? Putamen and? Globus pallidus. Can anybody tell me what is the role played by the bang basal ganglia in one or three words? Motor what does it do? Motor what about motor movement? Control. Control. It controls motor movement or function. In other words, it controls your movement. That's precisely the reason why patients with Parkinson's disease, guess what happens? You destroy the basal ganglia. Remember Muhammad Ali? He had what? Parkinson's. Why? Because there was damage to what? is basal ganglia, which stores dopamine. Now remember, dopamine is a neurotransmitter I mentioned last time, remember? Uh -huh. I talk about Muhammad Ali, float like a butterfly, and sting like a bee, but when he suffered from Parkinson's, he was what? Tremor. Having tremors. Dopamine is produced in the substantia nigra, but stored where? Here. With repeated trauma to the head in boxers, they found out it could destroy destroy the basal ganglia, and therefore, because its function is to control movement, you lose that ability to control movement. That's the reason why you have what? Tremors. What am I trying to show here? There is nothing that you cannot answer in the nursing board exam if you know your what? Anatomy. anatomy. Believe me. I should know. I've been teaching for 30 years. If you know your anatomy, believe me, you will not have problems passing that nursing board exam. If you lack dopamine, what do you think we give our patients who lack dopamine? <laughs> dopamine. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? You lack dopamine, give them dopamine. Unfortunately, though, it's only good for the first two or three months. Afterwards, they don't respond anymore. So we're trying to find ways to give them a better treatment plan. Now, what about the brainstem? 
what are the major components of the brain stem? You dissected the, the, the ship's brain last time. What do you call the part where you have the superior inferior colliculi? Cor with the corpora quadrigemina. Yes? Okay, very good. The midbrain. Otherwise known as the mesencephalon. What's next after midbrain? Hans, very good. And what's next? If you recall, especially the parts of the medulla oblongata, that is where a lot of cranial nerves would come from, right? But what makes the medulla important for our human body? Why is the medulla so important? It's cardiac and then Yes? What is it for? Cardiac. So it's a cardiac center. It regulates your heart rate. It makes it faster or slower. In other words, it can affect the autonomic nervous system. What else? It's a vasomotor what? What do you mean by vasomotor center? It controls what? No, okay. Vaso means blood vessels, my dear. Nothing to do with breathing. But I'll talk about breathing later on. When you say primary vasomotor center, vaso is spelled V-A-S-O-M-O-T-O-R. It regulates the capacity of the smooth muscles in the arteries to what? Contract or relax. When they contract, the arteries will what? Vasoconstrict, the blood pressure goes up. On the other hand, when the muscles in the wall of your arteries will relax, your vaso what? Dilation, the blood pressure drops, but the blood flow will increase, right? So who controls that? The medulla oblongata. So do you see, do you see the correlation between the brain and your blood vessels and cardiovascular system? Okay? But most importantly, as already somebody mentioned, it is the what center? Okay, it's called the respiratory center. In other words, it controls your what? Breathing. Your breathing. If you destroy your medulla oblongata, you will stop what? Breathing. And you will rest in? Peace. Six feet under the ground, then you will, of course, become a resident, permanent resident at Forest Lawn Cemetery, okay? So if ever you damage your medulla, that's it. A patient who suffers a stroke involving the brain test medulla, very poor prognosis because they cannot be weaned off from the ventilator. They will eventually die. I have seen many patients like that. I have seen a lot of cases where I handled with brainstem infarction or damage to the brainstem, particularly this area here, they don't, they have a very, very poor prognosis. They eventually die, okay? Now, let's go briefly into the meninges. There are two layer, three layers. What are these? Dura. Okay, what are these again? Dura, arachnoid, and then what? Very good. So what is the outermost top layer? Dura. And then you have what? Arachnoid, then what? Pia. And then Pia. Which one is on the surface of the brain? Pia. Pia, okay. So please do not get confused between the three. Skull, Dura, arachnoid, Pia. Correct? What do you call the space above the dura? What do you call the space below the dura? Okay, very good. What do you call the space below the arachnoid? And why is that space important? What is found there? Very good. What is found in the subarachnoid is your cerebrospinal fluid. Very good. Okay? So these three layers are important because they protect the brain. If somebody suffers from meningitis, it means that there is what? Inflammation of these three structures. Dura, arachnoid, pia. If you remember on the lecture on the spinal cord last time, do these meninges do protect the spinal cord too? Yes, they do, right? Epidural, subdural, and we talk about the spaces that are found there too, right? Okay, now, with regards to the, uh, the ventricles of the brain, how many ventricles do we have? Four. Okay, when you say four, you're referring to what? How many lateral ventricles do we have? Two. Two. Okay, lateral, lateral, okay, and then they are connected to the third by what? Interventricular foramen of Monroe. What connects the third ventricle with the fourth ventricle? Okay, the aqueduct. 
of Silvius or books would refer to it as the cerebral aqueduct of Silvius. You probably heard about the word Sylvia and Fisher. And what is the last ventricle? Fourth. fourth. And where does the fluid flow from the fourth ventricle? Where does it go? But before the subarachnoid space, there are two apertures. Okay, you have your median aperture, and what's the other one? Lateral. Lateral one. How many lateral apertures do we have? Two. Left and right. Okay. Now this lap. Now let me see if how much you have researched on this topic. Now unless you just relied on your book. Does anybody know the other name for lateral aperture? Okay, for your learning, I will add the word lateral for foramen of Lushka. <laughs> who is Lushka? I don't know who he is. <laughs> L-U-S-C-H-K-A. What's the first letter of Lushka? L. L. What's the first letter of lateral? L. 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 That's one thing you can remember the, the name. What about the first letter of median? M. M. So you have here the word for Raymond of what? Magendi. Who is Magendi? I have no idea. But these are people whose names were used so that they can be remembered by people like us. Okay? Now the word aperture and the word for Raymond, do they mean the same thing? Yes, they do. The word for Raymond and the word aperture, do they mean the same thing? Yes, they do. There's a hole, an opening, so that the cerebrospinal fluid will flow. Now, what is there for? From here, where does the fluid go? Okay. The sub arachnoid space, which means that it will go throughout the brain subarachnoid space and even the spinal cord. Whatever fluid you find here in the brain will also be the same fluid where? Because they're continuous, right? So when you have meningitis here, can I get cerebrospinal fluid here? Yes. At the level of what again? <coughs> L4, L5. Why? Because spinal cord ends where? L1, L2. Right? We do a lumbar tap or spinal tap when people have what? Seizures when you have meningitis. Now, so the question now is, if this is the flow of CSF, it's just logical. Why? Because it flows from top going down by gravitational pull. But what exactly produces the CSF here? Okay, very good. Do you find cord plexus? And remember the word ependymal cells? Glia, CSF? Do you find cord plexus and ependymal cells in your lateral ventricles? Yes. Do you find cord plexus and ependymal cells in your third ventricle? Yes. Do you find cord plexus in your fourth ventricle and ependymal cells in the fourth ventricle? Yes. Yes, you do. So every time you think of cord plexus, you think of what? What, what? what is a cord plexus, by the way? See, you know the answer. But a smart student will also say, what the hell is that? Do you understand what I'm trying to say here? It's a network of vessels. Okay, very good. Network of what kind of vessels, my dear? Capillary. Okay, very good. And what is a capillary? It's the smallest blood vessel. So, if it's a blood vessel, what is found inside the blood vessel? <coughs> huh? Okay, relax, relax, chill. Okay. Okay. Remember, keep it simple, student. K I S S. Okay. Keep it simple, student. So, what is found inside the blood vessel? Blood. Very good. See, chill, relax. Let's just make it simple. You know. Make sure your mind is so simple and just simple. You know? If it contains blood, what is blood made, mostly made of? Plasma first. And what is plasma made of? Water. There you go. So what do you think is the raw material used to produce your CSF? Water. The water that came from the blood. Does it make sense? Okay. So your CSF is water. Blood is water in the plasma. Isn't that amazing? Okay. In other words, this capillary network is going to filter the blood, remove the water, and convert that into what? CSF. 
Now, we said it goes to the subarachnoid space, right? In the subarachnoid space, so if you have what? The dura, epidural, subdural, arachnoid, this is the space, right? Mm -hmm. This is the pia, this is the arachnoid. What is in the arachnoid that is responsible for draining and removing the fluid? Yes, my dear. And what is found in the arachnoid granulation? Villi. Very good, that's the answer I want to hear. So in other words, it is the arachnoid villi in what? The arachnoid granulation that will what? What does it do? Drain. Drain, drain what? The CSS. You know what the word drain means? To remove. Remove them from where? The subarachnoid space. What do you think will happen if that drain does not remove the CSF? What happens to our, oh my God, it's called hydrocephalus, right? Have you heard of the word hydrocephalus? <laughs> yes. There's too much water, why it's not being what? So what do you think, will, what, 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 will, what will damage the villi when you have meningitis, right? Because when you destroy the meninges, can it be able to drain or remove the fluid? That's why you have hydrocephalus. In babies, <coughs> The head becomes bigger because the sutures have not fused it yet. But you, can your head become bigger? Yeah. No. Will, will it affect your brain when you have hydrocephalus? Yeah. There will be increased pressure where? Inside the brain. And you can die later on. We'll talk, we'll talk about that in positive physiology, right? Now, going back to this. So, do you understand what's the way it's important to know these things? Anatomy. Normal anatomy is important so that you will know what is what? Abnormal. I compare this as like taking a bath, you know? The shower head is your what? Choroid plexus. Produces the CSF. And these are found in the ventricles of the brain. The CSF goes to the booty. And in this bathtub below there is what? The drain. The drain. And what is that drain? Arachnoid villi. Now what happens if that drain is clogged by your hair? It's clogged, therefore, the, will the blood of water be able to flow? Yeah. What will be the subsequent effect? That's nice. Flooding. There will be flooding in the entire bathroom, not just like the bathtub, right? Same thing here. When this villa is destroyed by meningitis, it won't be able to drain the CSF. There will be a lot of CSF in your ventricles. On CT scan, this will all be what? Dilated, quite big. And we need to give medications to what? Lower the intracranial pressure so that you won't die. Do you understand, class? So I, I, now you might say, why do, why do I need to know about these things now? Because I'm just trying to put the foundation so that when you go to pathophysiology, you realize, OMG, I really need to know this then. Because will this topic come out in the anatomy exam? There is no anatomy exam. What exam are you going to take? The nursing exam. Will the nursing exam talk about meningitis? Yes. And how to take care of these patients? Definitely, yes. Okay, now, so is there anything, any question about this in terms of the ventricle, the production of CSF? No questions, guys, right? Now, what about your cranial nerves? How many cranial nerves do we have? Wow. Okay. Now, notice, now I'm not saying that, and I've been telling this to you, get the whiteboard, do what I do inside the classroom. What am I doing in the classroom? Did I look at any notes? No, no I did not. So I'm trying to tell you that if you can follow what I do, it could be good for you. Without looking at your notes, do I need to memorize 1 to 12? Yes. Okay, let's review. What is 1? Well, fact, your sense of? So where do you put the number 1 in your notes? 1. Okay. What about the 2? Sense of sight, optic nerve. What about 3? So all the six cranial uh, muscles of the eyeball, remember? What are those? Superior rectus, inferior rectus, medial rectus, inferior oblique, right? Why? Because what innervates the lateral rectus? Abducens. What is abducens? Number six. What about your superior oblique? What muscle? Uh, ner cranial nerve. So what is this? Superior what? What about abducens? And what about oculomotor? All the four muscles that we have just mentioned. The bottom line is this. Do you need to memorize all these? Yes. yes. Because one of the things you will be doing is to do a nursing neurological examination of your patients. Okay? 
What about five? What is five? And what is vaginal nerve four? Muscles of chewing, yes. Even the sensation of the face. The muscles of facial expression is facial nerve, seven. But sensation to the face, what is that? Five, trigeminal nerve. What about the sensation to your teeth? Same thing, trigeminal nerve. How many branches does a trigeminal nerve have? Ophthalmic branch, maxillary branch, and then what? Did I put that in the study guide? Yes. It simply means one thing. If there is a foreign body that enters your eye, <coughs> And what do most people do? <coughs> Rub the eye and that can that cause a pain? Yes. Why do you experience that pain? Who is responsible for you to be able to feel that pain? The ophthalmic branch of cranial nerve number five. We don't even recommend that you do that because it will destroy your eye. What about the maxillary branch? To the maxillary teeth. If you have a toothache involving the teeth in the maxilla, that is what? the maxillary branch of your trigeminal nerve or cranial nerve number five. Then the five, Roman numeral V is what? Five. It's not victory, okay? What about the mandibular branch? Toothache involving the teeth of the lower mandible, okay? What about seven? Facial. What about eight? Vestibular cochlear nerve for sense of hearing and sense of balance. What about your nine? Glossopharyngeal nerve. Okay, what is that for? Hearing and balance. Swallowing. Nine? Swallowing. Okay. Okay. So what? What does glossal mean? <coughs> so posterior one third of the tongue, sensory what? Innervation. So what is a sensory innervation to the posterior one third of the tongue? Glossopharyngeal nerve. What about the anterior two thirds of the tongue? Yeah. Who, who said facial nerve? Huh? Me. You. And you, what's your name? Irina. Are you sure about that? Mm -hmm. If your answer is wrong, are you, okay. I was about to say, I will cut your hair, okay? But that would think the answer is correct, okay? And there what? Did you, did, did you get this in your readings? Mm -hmm. why, why do you think it's important? Same thing in your patient. When you handle your patients, if the patient complains of loss of taste, Involving the anterior two-thirds of the tongue, what cranial nerve is involved? Seven. Seven or facial nerve. What about the posterior one-third of the tongue? Nine. What about the base of the tongue? What's the sensation to the base of the tongue? Vagal. Hmm? Vagal. <coughs> what is vagus? Oh, is it vagus? Ah, I'm just kidding. Vagus, you are absolutely right. What is that? Base of tongue. Now, you would say, Dr. Gamma, there is so much already information. Should I remember all of these? What do you think is the answer? Yes. You want to be successful in nursing? You have to know all these things. And make sure, not only do you know them, but that, that's the wrong term, move them by heart, but know them what? In the brain, right? Okay. Oh, I forgot to mention, what part of the brain is important for long-term memory? The hippocampus, and this hippocampus is part of what? The limbic system. Limbic system. Why is the limbic system important? Emotional, Emotional brain. Remember I told you the joke I made? <laughs> Every Valentine's Day, what do you say? I love you with all my... Because it's not the heart, that is emotion. It is the limbic system, right? Okay, now going back to this. So hearing and balance, nine, posterior one third of the tongue, ten, vagus nerve, base of the tongue. What about eleven? And why is accessory nerve important? Muscles of what? Sternocleidomastoid. Trapecius. The trapecius is at the back, right? Okay, do you understand? Now what about 12? Hypoglossal from the word tongue. It's the one that controls movement of the tongue. That means it controls muscles in the tongue. Tongue movement. Now that's different from glossopharyngeal because it is the posterior one third of the tongue that is what? Sensation. Do you understand? Okay? Now, with regards to the autonomic nervous system, why is this important? Well, in the autonomic nervous system, right, there are two major components. One would be what? Sympathetic. The other one would be? 
Very good. <coughs> now, which one is involved in the fight, fright, and flight? <laughs> so fight, some book would say fright, you're afraid. And what happens when you are afraid in a fight? Panic. And what do you do? What is flight? Run. You run away, okay? Somebody with a gun, are you going to go to that person and say, okay, shoot me, shoot me. <laughs> I'm not kidding, some people do that. They're not thinking, remember? A gun is in the hands of a person, and here you are, you're trying even to tell the guy, okay, shoot me, shoot me, and he shoots you, and then you, you would ask him, why did you shoot me? <laughs> Have you ever seen that? Why did you shoot me? Because you told me to shoot you. <laughs> but in the normal scheme of things, what should we do? What does flight mean? To run away from the source of what? Impending danger. If this building is on fire, are we going to stay in this building? No. What do we do? We run away, right? Right? Does that make sense to you guys? And what is the goal, ultimate goal of this sympathetic system? To keep you alive. To keep you alive. In other words, in one word, survive. Okay? You want to survive? You want to do... How many of you wants to die? Nobody, right? You want to survive, right? Now, what about the parasympathetic nervous system? Rest and digest. Okay, can anybody tell me what do you mean by rest and digest? Please explain. Okay, you give me the right answer, but you have to explain. Yes, ma'am, Ms. Morales. It conserves energy. Okay, conserve energy, and what else? Okay, those are the effects. When you say rest and that, yes? Sedentary activity. Sedentary What? Okay, so it's very simple. Digest means to break down food into small particles that you can get what? Energy. Energy, but in this case, it's more involving the GI tract, right? And we'll talk about it in detail. So rest and digest. Digest is involving the GI tract, and we're going to talk about that. Why? Okay, in in a, in a little while. So if you want to survive, if I were to tabulate this, right? And this is how, how you do things. Aside from creating a concept map, I, I talked about concept maps before, right? It's going to guide you what, how to think, and how to think. It will summarize all the information that I need to know. And that's why the reason why I said buy a black, black whiteboard like this and buy a marker and do what I do here. Now I know you cannot read my handwriting, but you can read your own handwriting, right? So create your own maps or a table like this. What will be the effect on the pupils in a sympathetic response? Okay, it's called pupillary dilation. Why? Because yes. You what? You get a boost of energy. Is that the only reason why? No, because you're alert. Yes? You're alert. You're more aware. Aware, alert. I want something more simple. Why won't you want to dilate your pupils? So you, can see more. you can see what? More. You can see what? More. You can see what? More. Of course! When your pupils are dilated, you want to see more. What is that green sign there, word there that says there? Exit. Do you want to see, don't you want to see where the exits are? Yeah. In the building that is on fire, what happens to the electrical current? Bang! Brown out, black out, no electricity. <laughs> but what do you think will happen to those green lights there with exit signs? They're gonna be stay on. That is the purpose of those green lights there. So that when you people say, oh my gosh, I need to go here or there. <laughs> right, so I need my pupils to be what? What about the other one? Constriction. Constriction. What about the heart rate? Increase. Increase heart rate. Why? Have you ever noticed what I'm asking every time I ask a question? There's always a question what? Why? Adrenaline. Where? What? Yes? Mm -hmm. So re remember, I want you to think carefully. Why do you want your heart rate to be faster or increased? In a sympathetic what? What? Okay, provide more what? Blood to the muscles that is needed for what? To run away. Very good, right? So this is exactly the reason why you go into tachycardia, a heart rate more than 100 beats per minute, because 
When you have more increased heart rate, what will the heart do? Pump more blood. And when you pump more blood, where does the blood need to go? Does it, go, does it need to go to the skin? Yes, no. no. Why the skin? It's, it's a, it's at this situation, you're dying. There's a fire. You don't want the blood to go. You, where do you want to go, make the blood go? Where? Your heart. Well, the heart first, but the brain. Why, why the brain? You can think. So that, hey, shucks. I remember that. Dr. Gamo said, I need to use the exit sign. <laughs> oh, I remember that. I'm in the second floor. Am I going to use the elevator or the stairs? I'm going to use the stairs. Why? Because there is more blood going to where? The brain. And you can think clearly and decisively what I need to do. Why do people die? Because they fail to think clearly. I'm not kidding. Sad to say, in a building on fire, you think clearly because you need to go where there is the exit. Don't use the stairs. I use those, don't use the elevator, but use the stairs, right? Okay. What about, so aside from the muscles, you will need blood, more blood to the brain. What about the lungs? Yes, what about the GI tract, your stomach, a small intestine? No! What for? You won't die if you don't eat. At that time, when it's, what is the opposite of increased heart rate? Decrease. You relax, rest, chill, okay. Mm -hmm. What about bronchioles? What happens in the sympathetic? Okay, why? Hmm? Okay, you want the airway to be open, and you want the more air to go in, which contains oxygen, and you want to get rid of carbon dioxide, right? So, which is obvious. You want bronchial dilation, which means the smooth muscles will have to what? Relax to open up the airways, so that you have more oxygen going to your body, that there will be more blood and oxygen to your brain, and you can think properly, right? What is the opposite of bronchial dilation? Constriction. Have you ever noticed one thing here? It's always the opposite. So I would suggest, which do you think is better to memorize? Sympathetic or parasympathetic? Why? Because it keeps you alive. <laughs> keeps you alive. Because everything normal happens in the, in the parasympathetic. Okay, if, if you were given a choice between memorizing this and that, I would memorize this because this is the one that's important. It's the one that keeps you alive in a given situation. Do, do you understand? Now, why do I need to memorize only one thing? What happens during the nursing exam? If you get confused and OMG, <laughs> you put this here and this there, I will tell you. All your answers will be wrong. Okay? This system is so important because why? It is the one that affects your what? Drugs, your pharmacology. Right? And I will go to that later on. What about the peristalsis in your... Uh, before I go that, stomach acid. HCL. What will the sympathetic do? More acid or less acid? Less, 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 less. What? Less. Why? Who is responsible for digestion? So here, more what? Acid. And what is hydrochloric acid for? No, it's not fair. You have not had any lectures on the GI tract. Chemical digestion. Chemical breakdown. Because is hydrochloric acid a chemical compound? Yes. It is, a, is it a very for, powerful acid? It can break down the meat, which serves as protein, right? Okay. So more acid, why? Because what is the parasympathetic for? Now, aside from the fact that the parasympathetic nerves are important, there's one cranial nerve, there are actually four of them, which among the four affects your GI tract mostly. What is that cranial nerve? Very good. It's called what? Vagus. The parasympathetic vagus nerve. What happens in vagus stays in vagus, okay? The vagus nerve, otherwise known as cranial nerve number? Ten. I like this class very fast. Ten. Will make the acid be more produced and released by the stomach. What about the peristalsis in the small and large intestine? Peristalsis. Small and large intestine. What will it do for the power sympathetic? Most faster or slower? Faster. Okay, faster what? Digestion. Faster peristalsis. Why? Because there will be more Digestion. Digestion and later on absorption. So this will actually promote more, more what? Bowel movement. 
So the end result is more bowel movement here, right? Because remember, peristalsis involves the smooth muscles in the small and large intestine and the stomach wall. There will be more what? Bowel movements. What about sympathetic? Less, Less peristalsis. And therefore, there will be what? Eventually, constipation. Why? Why? Have you ever asked yourself? Just plain simple thinking, please. Plain simple thinking. Hmm? Digestion is not a problem. Hmm, yes? You're not pooping. Okay. You have to give me a very, I, I'm not saying uh, you're not giving me uh, logical answers, but remember the key is to what? Survive. Yes, yes? Not the blood supply. Why do you want to have less peristalsis and become constipated in a emergency situation when the building is on fire? Uh huh. What? Okay. Okay, very good. At least you have something common sense. Okay. So, class, please. Uh, as I said, my intention is to make you develop common sense, simple thinking. Again, it's not my intention to make people look dumb. It's my intention to make you understand. Hey, shit. The only reason why we need to do this is why? There's no time to go to make poo poo. Why? The building's on fire. Can you imagine? You are in this class, the building is on fire, the emergency siren. And here you are. Sir, sir, can I make poo poo first before I leave the building? Because I am having increased. No! <laughs> the body will go into a survival mode. Your body will, whether you like it or not, will make you become more what? Constipated. Constipated, because that is what it is designed for. You are designed to what? Die or survive? Survive. With the what system? Do you, do you understand? Yes. There is no time to make poo poo and go to the toilet. <laughs> you would rather run and get out of this what? Building on fire. Right? Do you understand? Just relax, chill, you know. There's no time. That, that one or two minutes that you decided to make bupo that could really engulf the entire building. Oh, it's too late. I'm gonna die. Bye, professor. I made my decision to die. Joke only. Okay? You understand, okay? Now, now let me see. What about your bladder muscle? I'm talking about the urinary bladder muscles. What happens in sympathetic? Will they contract or relax? Contract. contract. Who says relax? I see one hand relaxed. The only one person who raised their hand. How many of you, I do not know the answer. Raise your hand, be honest. Okay, one more time. Who says contract? A while ago. <laughs> okay, I only saw one hand for relax, so only one hand, right? What's your name? Ariane. Okay, relax. Why? The answer is correct. Because you don't need to go. Into Why not? The building is on what? Fire. <laughs> you are absolutely right. Have you been inside the bladder? Not yet. Okay, let's pretend we are inside the urinary bladder. In the wall of the bladder are what we call detrusor muscles. If the muscles contract, bang, what happens to the urine? Flow. If the muscles relax, bang, the urine will stay where? Inside the bladder. Why do you want the urine to stay here, inside the bladder? Because there is no time to make wee-wee. Uh, excuse me, sir, can I make wee-wee first? I don't care about the building on fire. I just have to make wee-wee. So he goes to the wee-wee, the building is on fire, he will? Die. He will burn to death. Do you understand why we need to make those muscles relax? Yes. On the other hand, what happens here? So relax, the trusal muscle of the bladder, urinary bladder. Here the muscles will what? Contract. You want the muscles to contract so that the urine will flow. Now somebody said, what about Dr. Gamo when there is a stressful situation like you have a guy as big as Shaquille O'Neal and somebody who's five feet and Shaquille O'Neal who is seven feet two inches. Why is it that they make pee pee in front of Shaquille O'Neal? Does anybody know the reason why? That was supposed to be what? Survival sympathetic response. 
So normally that guy is so scared that he's supposed to what? Run. Run. At the same time what? Muscles relax so that he won't make wee wee. But unfortunately, how come the urine will flow and you can see the pants getting wet? <coughs> he wet his pants. He was so scared with the big guy with the gun. I don't have to. I don't need a gun with Shaquille O'Bey seven feet. So I'm only five feet high. The best thing to do is what? Buy Shaquille. I'm going to survive, right? <laughs> but why is that guy made wee wee? Why, why did he make wee wee? Do you know the reason why? Hmm? Now, I know it's not fair. I, we had no lectures in the urinary tract first. Okay, I, I'll, I'll give you an idea. What controls our urination or voiding? Muscle. muscle. What muscle is this called? Yes? Sphincter, very good. What is the name of that sphincter? Internal and external. External or internal urethral sphincter? Okay, I'll give you the answer. It's called external. External urethral sphincter is made up of skeletal muscle. What about the internal urethral sphincter? Smooth. Smooth. So which one will be voluntary? Skeletal. It's made of skeletal. Controlled by what? The brain. What part of the brain? The frontal lobe. Which part of the frontal lobe? Pre-settled gyrus. Okay, so normally, you and I, in the burning building, the blood vessels muscles are relaxed, but you must make sure that the external urethral sphincter is going to what? Contract. So that is what will come out. Can you imagine? You're going down the stairs and you are making... Or the muscles are contracting. You don't want that to happen, right? And somebody said, Oh, Dr. Gao, that's good for the fire. <laughs> a joke only. Yeah, this, this came from one of us. It's a joke, Dr. Gama, but I know. Do you understand? Yes. So in the process of micturition, or what we call urination, or voiding, you need both the muscles of the tetrusor muscles of the urinary bladder wall, which would what? In this case, relax. But this external urethral sphincter must what? Because it's skeletal, it's controlled by the brain, so that the urine will not flow. And then when you get out of the burning building, you look for the nearest McDonald's <laughs> and make wee wee and make poo poo. You understand? Because you have all the time now. Do you understand? Is that clear? Yes. Now, why, why am I so in emphasizing this chapter? I'll tell you why. I don't know if you have read the details of these. What are the neurotransmitters here? Alpha, and beta. Alpha and beta, adrenergic receptors, correct? Okay. Although I did not mention this, but I just wanted you to be aware. Why do you think it's called adrenergic? From what neurotransmitter? Adrenaline. Oh my goodness. Remember adrenaline and noradrenaline, right? Right? Okay. So, if you have these neurotransmitters, you have alpha and beta adrenergic receptors. Basic, uh, uh, the adrenergic receptors, they will stimulate what? Sympathetic, right? So, what will happen to the heart rate? Increase heart rate. And what would be the effect on your blood pressure? Increase blood pressure. Right? Do you understand? So, I just want to give an example why this topic is very important and it's very close to my heart. Because it's about the heart. When you go into core nursing, you deal with pharmacology, we always think about beta blockers. You, you will encounter this. Do you know what is the word between these two words, beta blockers? Beta adrenergic one. <laughs> blockers. So what do you mean by blockers? The effect would be what? The opposite. You will hear the word propranolol. Atenolol. L-O-L, laugh out loud. Gamolol. I'm just joking, that's not, that's not a new drug, but it's my name. So what are these drugs called? Beta blockers. And what will be the effect? Decrease heart rate, what will be the effect on blood pressure? So do you realize how important the system is? Both autonomic and sympathetic and parasympathetic. How important is that for nursing? Believe me. You will encounter you need to know this because when you go to core nursing and when you start talking about drugs and medications, you will encounter a lot of this. This is just one example of them. 
I wanted you to know that this is the reason why it's important that you have to know this system. But I, did I tell you to go into the details? No. Just know the effects. If it's an adrenergic blocker, the effect would be opposite here, similar to this. Right? Do you understand? A patient, for example, with hydrochloric acid, what is that called? Hyperacidity with bleeding stomach ulcers. Are we going to cut the vagus nerve? Yes or no? No. Yes, we are. Yes. We wanted to stop making it. Okay, so remember, before we answer, we have to what? Yes. Think carefully. <coughs> My question was, are we going to cut the vagus nerve if you have hyperacidity? No. no. Yes. 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 Class, because please, for favor. Stop we said vagus nerve is going to make what? More acid. See that? The patient already has hyperacidity. Am I going to cut the vagus nerve that goes into the stomach? Yes. yes. What about the one that goes to the small and large intestine? No. No, because they don't produce acid. The surgeon uses the same anatomy principles. He will perform a procedure called what? Vagotomy. And what is the purpose of that procedure? To cut what nerve? Why do we want to cut the vagus nerve so that you will what? Stop the production of? Produced by what? The stomach. Why? Because what is the problem of the patient? Hyper what? And it leads to the development of bleeding what? Stomach ulcers. Unless we cut the vagus nerve, that patient could die. Of what? Bleeding stomach ulcers. Yeah. Do you understand? Yes. You're going to be future nurses. Are you going to be working with doctors and surgeons? Yes. yes. Will this topic that I'm talking about will come out in the nursing board exam? Yes. So I, I hope nobody comes, oh, Dr. Gamma, give us too much information. I'm not. I'm just giving you the information that you need to know on the topic that is being discussed in preparation for your core nursing and board exam. But it's just my concern here. It is not really my intention to make you overwhelmed, but it's, it has to be very important Clinical anatomy. Clinical means, what does it have to do with me as a nurse? What's meningitis? What is vagotomy? Why do we need to cut the vagus nerve in hyperacidity? You know the reason why. Does that make sense? Or let's say a patient with asthma, with wheezing. <laughs> there is what? Bronchoconstriction and bronchospasm. They're exposed to the allergen. Which do you think is going to be given to the patient? Epinephrine, why? If you give epinephrine, what, what does it do? Bronchodilator. Have you heard of the word epi? EpiPen? See, there's nothing you cannot answer. A patient who's dying in front of you because of that, you can give EpiPen, right? Intramuscularly, because epi means what? Epi, epinephrine, which means adrenaline, that's involved in the sympathetic, and what does it do? Bronchodilate. Do you understand? Okay? Is that clear? Now, the sense organs, let's talk about, I think there was a need for you to know the different receptors, so you can go over that. Obviously, if it's bowel receptor, pressure receptor. Chemo means chemicals, like what? The tongue, right? When I say tongue, you're dealing here with what? Sense of taste. Are there taste buds? Yes, you do, right? And what's another name for sense of taste? Gas station, very good. Gas station. Lori, right? Nicole. Uh, Nicole. Uh, Mr. Uh, Nicole. What's your last name? Cruz. Cruz. I'm getting confused because of so many people. Okay, Nicole Cruz. Okay. So the, the bottom line, therefore, is you need to know all these things, right? In terms of the. Uh, now, when you can sense organs and receptors, we have to have receptors for sensation to be manifested or. It, felt by the patient. So you have tactile receptors, chemo receptors, example would be the tongue, bowel receptors, your carotid sinus or blood pressure monitoring, and all those thermal receptors. And what is a receptor for pain? Anybody? Yes, yes? Nosy. Nosy receptors, okay. So now, let's go directly into the uh, Let's deal first with the ear, okay? The ear is made up of three components. What are the components of the ear? External, external, middle, and 
Okay. My, my, hand, my, my, my diagram is very poor, okay? You have the external ear, and the other one is what? Middle, Middle ear, and the other one is? Internal. Internal or inner ear, right? Now, the external ear, as you remember, you can, ask, you can have what? The, what is this called? Oracle. Oracle or the pina, okay? And this is called what? The ear canal or the external auditory what? Meatus. And this is called the eardrum. What's the other, other, another name for eardrum? Very good. And what is found in the middle ear? Auditory what? Ossicles. Malleus, incus, and then what? Staples. So which one is near the eardrum? Hmm? Malleus. Malleus, okay. And what is this after the staples? Oval what? Okay, very good. You saw this in the diagram, right? Yeah. And then you have here a series of what? The, the vestibule, and then what? Semicircular canal, and then you have the, what do you call the structure that looks like a nail? A snail. Cochlea. And what does the cochlea contain? The organ of what? Organ of corti, which is the organ for hearing, right? What is found inside the cochlea will be the organ of what? Very good. And it contains the organ for hearing, which is the organ of corti. Okay? Now, here before the organ of corti, you have the vestibule and the semicircular canal. What is the re relevance of these structures here? They're for important for equilibrium. Which one is important for dynamic equilibrium? As if you're inside a roller coaster or you're a ba ballerina, like this. Is it the vestibule or semicircular canal? Semicircular. Dynamic what? How do you remember this? Because which one looks like a roller coaster? The semicircular canal. Dynamic is if you are inside the uh, roller coaster, you're being spin around, or when you're doing a turn as a ballerina, or you're doing um, skating, you know, in, on, in the rink. Now what about vestibule? What is this for? Static what? What is static? You're able to maintain your balance even though you are what? Sitting. Can you move your list? Now did I tell you to study the details of this? No, no need. It talks about all those auto lists there now. All you need to know is that that portion of the ear called the vestibule is for what kind of equilibrium? Static, that means you're not moving, you're either standing or sitting but you still have to maintain what? Your balance or equilibrium. On the other hand, when you're moving, like you're spinning around like a ballerina, or let's say you're dancing, or let's say you are in a contest where you have to spin around, you need your semicircular canal. That's called dynamic equilibrium. Now, what is the receptor found in the organ of corti for hearing? Hair cells. Very good, I like that. It's called what? Hair cells. Hair cells. They're similar to the rods and cones in the eye. Okay, so, so apparently what happens here is this. So example, when I sing, the hills are alive, with the sound of music, what happens? The sound enters the ear canal, it causes vibration of the eardrum or tympanic membrane, it vibrates the malleus, it vibrates the incus, it vibrates the stapes, vibrates the oval window, causes the movement of what? The endolymph fluid and then stimulates the hair cells in the organ of corti that you are able to perceive what? Sound. Sense of hearing and sound. Now, what connects the middle ear with the nasopharynx? What connects the middle ear with the nasopharynx? What is it called? It's called the eustachian tube. Is there another name for the eustachian tube? Very good, I like that answer. What's another name for eustachian tube, auditory tube? So, so it will give me an, an idea if you have read and researched more. So you know it's called eustachian tube, it's called auditory tube, but there's another word. Very good, who said pharyngo? Pharyngo what? 
Very good. Faringo tympanic what? Why pharyngeal tympanic? Pharynx. Which part of the pharynx? Nasal. Okay. What about the middle ear? The tympanic membrane. Okay, and tympanic cavity. So what is the significance of this recension tube? It connects the middle ear. So what part of the ear? The middle. What part of the ear? With what? Okay. Now why? Why? What is the purpose of that, therefore? Air pressure. Very good. What about air pressure, uh, my dear? Controls the air pressure coming in. What do you want to do with the air pressure? Uh, so you are beginning to give me the right answer, but I want the proper keyword. Yes, Ms. Morales? Okay, if you take a plane ride at 27,000 feet, what happens? You have this ear discomfort, right? Why? The pressure inside the plane and the pressure outside the plane and in your ear is not the same. The atmospheric pressure and the pressure inside is not the same. You have that ear discomfort. How do you, the word I want to hear is what? Who said equalize? Yo, that's the word I want to hear, right? <laughs> what, what? No, you might be, you are laughing. That's, it's not my, it's not my intention. It's just what it is. In the world of accuracy and learning, you have to use proper one. Because if you have an exam that says, what will equalize air pressure between the ear canal, uh, the, the tympanic cavity and the atmospheric, it's, it's what it is. Equalizes the pressure, right? How do you do that? You inside the plane, what do you do? You open your mouth, you yawn. And you hear that popping sound. What does that popping sound do? Open the eustachian tube or auditory tube, equalize the pressure. Now, what is a problem here with regards to five-year-old kids? When you have what? Sore throat, running nose, cough, colds. Well, the bacteria in the throat and the nose, <laughs> can the bacteria travel to the middle ear? Yes. Can they have oh, middle ear infection? Yes. It's called otitis from the word O-T-O -O means ear. Itis means infected, media means middle ear. Do you understand? So what I'm trying to show you, therefore, is that by knowing anatomy, you know what is going to be abnormal anatomy, which is middle ear infection. Do you understand? Okay? Now, what about the eye? The eye, I cannot draw the eye, so. <laughs> <laughs> but if you can draw the eye in a white blackboard, why not? So let's pretend. Let's pretend I can draw the eye, okay? What's the first layer? If I put the contact lens into my eye, what will be the first thing that will be hit? Very good. Right? And then the cornea, what do you call that white part of your eye? Very good. Right? Okay. Sclera. So you, this is the cornea. This is what? The iris here. Right? What is the iris? The iris is, what is it? What is actually is the iris? What? A muscle, very good. And what are these two types of muscle? Sphincter and dilator, pupillae. So one will dilate the pupils, one will what? Constrict the pupils, right? The iris is a muscle. The iris is the one that gives the color to what? To your eye. Like for example, how many of you have blue eyes here? I'm talking about not contact lenses. Okay, nobody. Okay, what about green eyes? You have green eyes? Hazel, green. Okay, what about brown? What about black? Or what about black and brown? That's me, okay? So what gives color to my beautiful eyes? The pigment in the iris. But in fact, it's a muscle. What's the other muscle here? Hmm? Okay, sit. very good. You said that. Very good, you're studying. So there are two muscles here. What are these called muscles called? Intraocular. What about what do you mean by intraocular? Inside the eyeball. There are two: iris and what? Ciliary body or ciliary muscle. What about the extraocular? The six muscles: lateral rectus, middle rectus, superior rectus, inferior rectus, superior. Rectus. These are extraocular because they are found what? Outside the eyeball. Okay. Now, so the the, the ciliary body is here. You have the so zonules, and then what is there? The lens, right? The lens is there, the ciliary body, with the uh, suspensory ligaments and sonials. And then, what do you call this?
structure in front of the lens. Anterior what? Anterior cavity, right? What about behind the lens? Posterior cavity, which contains what? The vitreous humor, right? Vitreous what? Humor or body, which actually what? Like liquid gel. What do you find in front of the lens? Anterior what? Cavity or chamber, but it's divided into the anterior and posterior chamber by the iris. What is found in front of the iris? Anterior chamber, behind the iris. Posterior, posterior chamber. Okay. In this area of the ear eye, you have what? The aqueous humor. Aqueous humor. Behind the lens, what do you have? Vitreous humor. Okay. And at the back area, you have what? The retina. Okay. The retina contains what? Rods and cones. Which one is important for color vision? Which about night vision? Which one is important for bright light? Okay, dim light. Okay. So color vision, you need your cones. Bright light, you need your cones, right? So if a person is color blind, has some problems with color blindness, what do you think is affected there? The cones or the rods? Cones. What is the first letter of color? C. What is the first letter of cones? C. So that's how you remember things. But you don't get interchanged with the two. Okay? Does that make sense? So this kind of rods and cones, what, are, what kind of receptors are they? Very good. And what does photoreceptor mean? See? Do, do, do I run out of questions? No, I don't. So that is how you become smart, by asking yourself. I should be asking myself too. It's, I, I want to learn. I want to be the smartest guy in the world. I need to answer what, where, why, how. So you mentioned the word photoreceptor. And what does photo mean? Huh? Very good. What is it again? Light. Light. So what's the stimulus there? Light. In other words, when the light enters the eye like this, the first thing it hits would be what? The cornea. Now these are what we call, what is refraction? Bending of what? Bending of what? Bending of what? Bending of what? Light. Bending of what? Light, exactly. So when you have bending of light, who will bend the light? One, the cornea. Two, aqueous humor. Three, the lens. Four, vitreous humor. In other words, when the light penetrates the cornea, bang, bends, boom. Aqueous humor, boom, passes to the pupil. What does the lens do? Bend, bang. And then where does it go? To the cornea. I'm the retina. <laughs> I think I'm really hungry. I think my blood sugar is low. Okay? Why? Because that's where you find what receptors? Photoreceptors. What was the stimulus? Light. Not tactile stimulus. Not pain stimulus, but rather what? Light. Light. So what will this medium of refraction? What do they do? They bend the light. Do you understand? So this is going to bend. Aqueous humor will bend. The lens will bend. So in order for this to be able to bend the light, and in order for the light to penetrate this, what should be the color of your lens? Clear. Hmm? Clear, of course. Right? Have you heard of the disease called cataract? Yeah. What happens to the lens? Cloudy. Cloudy. Cloudy and what? What color? What color? White. Okay, put this in front of your eye. Can you see? No. You can't. Why? Because what happened to the lens? Instead of clear and transparent, it became what? White. White and cloudy. Very good. Does that make sense? What about the color of the cornea? Cloudy, white, or clear? Clear. clear. So everything must be clear. What about if you have bleeding here in the anterior cavity and chamber? It's red. 
Will you be able to see? No. no. You can't see why? Because it should be also clear. Why? Because the goal is to allow the light to what? All the way. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. How many of you are nearsighted here? That's like me. Okay. It's called myopia. What about if you're farsighted? Hyperopia. Who, who is farsighted here? Probably no. You're farsighted? So what's the difference between these two? Which one is a longer eyeball? People like me. We were gifted. I'm not saying that you're not gifted. What I'm saying is we were given an extra length of our eyeballs. So in other words, it is so long that the, <laughs> the retina is here instead of there. So when the light rays gets here, it's blurred. <coughs> so what happens if I wear this kind of glasses? It will bend, the glasses are here, bend, 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 bend. It will allow it to go where? To the retina because I have a longer eyeball. You understand? That's why I can now clearly see. What about people who are farsighted, like you? Unfortunately, your eyeball is short. Right? <laughs> and is the, 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 the focusing power will be at the back. That's why we give you a special type of lens, not like mine. You understand? Yeah. So who has the shorter eyeball? Far-sighted Far -sighted. Far people with hyperop. Who has the longer eyeball? Myopia. The myopic people, Myopia. like me and most of you, who are wearing glasses. See? Now, can we replace the lens nowadays? Yes. It's called intraocular lens implantation. If it's white, it's useless. You have to change it. Or else, that eight-year-old patient who is applying for a DMV license is going to what? Hit you on the freeway. So we said, Grandpa, there's hope for you. We can replace your what? The lens. The lens. With a brand new lens. Now it's quite amazing. Nowadays, it takes only 15 to 20 minutes. During my time in medical school, it took almost three hours. The old way. Now the new way, all you do is insert this device. It will dissolve the lens. Oh, we have not dissected the eye yet, right? Have we? No. It's very so it's solid, it's hard. You, you dissolve the lens, it becomes liquid, and what do you do, like a liquid gel? Suction it, and put it inside what? A brand new lens, courtesy of Johnson & Johnson. And you like brand new eyes. I'm not kidding, I, I'm so amazed when you have these kinds of procedures. How many of you have undergone um, the surgery here on the cornea, yes. What do you call that procedure? LASIK. LASIK, exactly. Do you know what they do there? Do you know? Did, you, did they explain it to you? Well, yeah, but I don't know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you had it done and you don't even know what it is? Okay. Anybody who knows? Don't they burn it? Okay. Laser surgery is laser, you know, like Darth Vader. <laughs> okay. So technically, what they'll do is that, remember, are you nearsighted before or farsighted? Far. Okay, so what happened was, you're farsighted, so without the procedure, or without your glasses, it's blurred because every time you use your glasses, without the glasses, its image is far behind the retina, right? So what LASIK will do is to replace the glasses. With my glasses, the focal point will reach the retina because it will, the glasses are here, bend, 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 it hits the retina. But without the glasses, my glasses here, I cannot, it's blurred, like blurred. <laughs> Why? Because the focal point, no, I, I don't have to explain what's focal point. It only ends here because I have such a long eyeball, like you, right? But if I wear the glasses like this, the glasses allows me to bend the light, bend the light, bend, 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 bang! I can see. Now, what did people who are smart do? They, what is what they did. So they followed the contour of the shape of that lens there, the shape, and with the aid of computer and laser, they would actually what? What would they do with the cornea? Bend it. Shave it. Perfect. Because they use what? Laser. Computer aided laser. So when they shave this, bang, without glasses, whoo! Did you have experience? 
Did yeah. you have that experience? Yeah. After the surgery done? Was it both eyes? Yeah, both eyes. How much did you pay? Uh, 3500 Shit. Oh. <laughs> I could have given it to you for 1000 And you'll be blind. <laughs> so both eyes or 3500 Don't tell me one eye. Okay, both eyes. Both eyes. So 1750 then. Wow. 1750 per eye. Three thousand five hundred is one car, a second-hand car, but it's worth. Is it worth it? Yeah. How, how old are you now, if you don't mind? Twenty-six. When did you have this done? Last year. So when you were twenty-five. November, yeah. You like it? Are you happy with it? Mm -hmm. Okay, give me the name of the surgeon. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm scared. I'm really scared. You are at the age of fifty-seven, not like you. If I have it done and they they, they botch up the computer and there's blackout or brownout during the. <laughs> So maybe if I will let the surgeon do if I have a backup generator. <laughs> you see what I mean? You always have a plan A, a plan B, and a plan C, and a plan D. <laughs> I'm not kidding. You're doing a computer study here that, that there's no power. Oh my God. And then the laser eek, destroys the entire eye. Well, actually has a spot where if, when it comes out of your cornea, it turns off automatically, so they can't mess up. The computer doesn't oh, that, it doesn't mess up. Okay, very good. The bottom line is that these are all equipments used by man. So that's always I'm scared. I, I, I've, my God, I've been heard about this for what, 10, 15 years now? Newer technology, but still, I'm still scared. So I would rather have contact lenses. I, this is one thing I can share with you. The first time I wore contact lenses was in 19... 78. Now, why did I like contact lenses? Because I do not have to use this. Then what, what is my favorite sport? Basketball. I play basketball. So it's hard to play basketball with what? <laughs> with glasses, right? So the first time I wore my contact lens, I was jumping up and down in the clinic <laughs> with the optometrist. Oh my gosh, I'm so happy now. I can play basketball <laughs> without my glasses. So that's why I'm happy for advancement of technology, yours, I'm still scared. <laughs> even if you give me one million dollars, I still won't have it done. Even 10 million, even one billion. Why? Because I'm still scared. <laughs> At your age, you're willing to take the risk? Me? No more. I'm almost 60 years old, so I'll be dead in maybe five years, 10 years. <laughs> okay, so let's have a break. Okay. Is it five minutes or ten?